welcome to another episode of The Backspace. This week's title, Red Light, Green Light, Red Light, Steam Light. This week, we talk about the good and very bad about Steam's green light system. We take a big old dump on pay to win systems, and we begin the show by blaming NASCAR for gaming's disappearance this week. Because Daytona 500 event today, stuck waiting for a rain delay to clear, whatever that means. Are you looking at his Facebook page? Are you creeping him? No, he sent an email. Oh, yeah, here we go. To quote Dan, hey, fellas, I got invited to a Daytona 500 event, and I'm stuck waiting for the rain delay to clear. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah. They don't race in the rain, eh? Well, huh. I mean, slippers. Indy races in the rain. Formula Drift goes in the rain. Actually, I was at a Formula Drift event in the rain. It was amazing. There were so many crashes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Isn't Daytona exactly. 500 all about the crashes anyway? I kind of think so. Well, yeah. I mean, I didn't. I never got the whole NASCAR thing at first. It always seemed like, oh, look, they're turning left. But after watching a few races, I kind of get it now. Like, there are more position changes in a single lap in NASCAR than you'll see sometimes an entire race in F1. So hmm. I kind of get it. It's pretty exciting, like wheel to wheel, um, lots of passing, lots of position changes, um, lots of crashes. It, it's pretty intense. It's very much like driver versus driver. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I'm starting to warm up to it a little bit. I always thought it was kind of silly at first, but, you know, there's like this sort of, um, you'll see this sort of elitist, like, oh, yeah, NASCAR is just turning left from, like, other forms of motorsports and people who are fans of rally and F1 and stuff. But uh, I kind of see the appeal now. It's really exciting to watch. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see them do it in our current weather. Oh, God. Like Snowmageddon, Vancouver, man. God. <laughs> I don't think we're allowed to complain, though, because the rest of Canada right now is just like, oh, Vancouver, that's cute. You got a bit of snow? Boo-hoo. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a real lack of sympathy for Vancouver whenever we get snow, that's for sure. It's funny because yeah. my friend who lives in Atlanta, um, you know, they got hit pretty hard. Um, and, well, they're not used to the, the snows. And, uh, yeah, posted weather where she's at today. And she's like, yeah, you know, it's 70 degrees, blah, 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 going for a bike ride. I'm like, <laughs> it's snowing here. <laughs> yeah georgia man that is that is a place that's not equipped to deal with snow at all no. no and living in vancouver it seems like we're not equipped either <laughs> not really nope. I mean, we have like two or three days worth of salt budget per year at least in vancouver proper i don't know about the rest of the gvrd pretty but, much yeah it's it, it gets ugly pretty fast so uh <clears throat> i think brian's gonna call in a sick day tomorrow <laughs> no yeah. So the podcast topic. Podcast topic. Why don't we just? Why don't we talk about what we did this week, guys? What did we do? What did, what we, did do? we get up to this week? What did we do? I didn't you worked from home all week, didn't you, Nelson? I sure <laughs> did. And it how, did was how did that go? Kind of good, kind of bad. Um, there's a lot of road construction and construction next door, so it was pretty much what it would be like at work, just with the. Uh, the hassle of having to teleconference with everyone and shitty communication, and it was just an absolute nightmare. I can't wait to get back to the office. <laughs> that is such a, that's so the opposite of what I thought you'd say. I know, right? <laughs> okay, well, the silver lining, getting to work in the morning, involves rolling out of bed and hitting the power button on my computer. And this <laughs> other silver lining, no pants. Yeah. That, that is a pretty is. big silver lining. Sure is. But, yeah. Because projects and whatnot, um, it's just easier to uh, actually collaborate at the office. Yeah, you can get that face-to-face -face time, right? Well, instant answers and proper answers instead of, like, me sending an email to the team, getting half an answer back if I'm lucky, and then trying to interpret what it even means. Yeah. yeah. You play any games this week? Lots and lots and lots of Rogue, uh, Rogue Legacy. <laughs> You're warming up to it, hey? <laughs> I, I killed the, the forest boss today. I was, I was very stoked about that. Good for you. Nice. Yeah, so I've downed the first boss, the uh, main castle boss, and downed um, that big fucking forest evil guy, which I did it with a brute. Yeah, I okay. did, it, did it with a brute, and it's pretty crazy. Nice. Sir, Sir McGlattery the second. <laughs> he, he, he fought valiantly and ended up dying on spikes. 
in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. All, there, there was no good ends for the characters in that game. No, no. I was kind of hoping for a more um, valiant ending to my that particular um, air, but yeah, Spikes, <laughs> Spikes did him in. He slipped. <laughs> Fell on Spikes. Mm, they play anything else? Nope. <laughs> nope. I always tended to go well, for the guys with the uh, peripheral arterial disease so they didn't set off the spikes. <laughs> uh, it's hard to find, like, every time I, I get my roll of three, I, I look for that trait and I'm like, no, no one has it yet. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. How about you, Brian? What have you been up to? Uh, trying, and, trying and failing at Spelunky still. <laughs> So I'm just, stuck on Rogue Legacy. You're stuck on Spelunky. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm missing the part of my brain that's supposed to learn that game. I'm not sure why. I, I, I just don't seem to be able to make any progress on it. And it's really infuriating to me. So in other words, you're not getting any better. No, I'm really not. I, I can fairly reliably get through the mines now. I just flail every time I get to the jungle. And I have these beautiful runs where I get like shotgun, jetpack, all the things, all the tools I need to to make the make the run work, but I always just end up doing something really stupid and, and killing myself, and it just turns into a gigantic Rube Goldberg machine of misery. And <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's here's it's Nelson's a frustrating uh, game. here's Nelson's pro Spelunky tip to Victor being victorious at Spelunky: stop mm-hmm. sucking. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm really it's, trying. That is really the Dark Souls of like 2D games, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, it's you know it's compelling enough to keep you coming back, but but man, it, it's just ruthless. It is absolutely ruthless. <laughs> so um, aside from that, I've been playing. I, I cracked out um, Witcher Two a little bit this Whoa. week too. Yeah, I went back to that. Um, that game is pretty tough too <laughs> hmm. yeah i i didn't get far in it i found the the ui to be like it just seemed miserable so impenetrable that yeah. i was i got really frustrated early on and kind of gave up and i'm starting to think if i go back i'm just going to play with the controller because it yeah. seems you have to that it was designed to that way whereas yeah. i was thinking about attacking it like skyrim with a mouse mm-hmm. keyboard which wasn't ideal either in that game let's be honest skyrim's ui was kind of a huge step back from previous Elder Scrolls games, mm-hmm. but um, it's it's a beautiful game. It's it's well written. It's got some interesting role playing game, you know, role playing mechanics and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's just the controls for me are not really sinking in, and I'm fine. I'm 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 getting my ass beat a lot in situations where I don't really need to. Kind of like Spelunky. Yeah, kind of. But uh, yeah, I guess yeah, this week has just been Brian is bad at video games week, so. <laughs> but, uh, oh yeah and i installed mass effect 2 oh nice I, I installed it that's about as you far as i that you should I will. play that i will it's Once, real good you know, that, is, that is a good game yeah i know it's real good. yeah that's a really good game I, I i can't say i love three too much i feel like it felt like a corridor shooter well i'm gonna playing. avoid three especially because of the um what do you call it the origin or whatever it is the fucking spyware yeah. shit Ah, Origin gets a lot of stick, but I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as people make it out to be. It's just it's it's because it's the tool of you know the oppressive publisher that the evil empire. Ar- yeah, it's it's yeah the evil empire. But quite frankly, I I leave it off. Like I, I have my Steam boot up when my computer starts. My Origin does not turn on unless I actually want to play an Origin game. So it's it's pretty unobtrusive for me. Huh. Right. Yeah, I install I install it when there was that. There was a really cheap Humble Bundle that gave away one of the Dead Space games and uh, Battlefield 3. Yeah, and I got that I one. I installed for that, and I don't know. I haven't really used it. I, I, it's not terrible. At least you can configure. Like, it's somewhat configurable. You can choose where you want the games to install. And, and yeah, if you don't set it to run at system start, it kind of just, you know, you just use It's just another launcher, and that's the thing. Is like yeah. I feel like I don't need another launcher in my life. Well, Ubisoft mm-hmm. does it too with all the AC stuff, you which play. is oh. fucking annoying. Yeah. But eh, I forgive them because they make great games. So, yeah, they do. They really do. Um, and it kind of bo- like apparently Uplay is going to be going away. Or oh, yeah, that's what I heard. Shit. What about all my chivos? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Your Uplay points, man. What What are you gonna do for those? I better spend them all and buy yeah. them. Uh, buy downloadable wallpapers and stuff. 
Yeah. Oh, but, oh wow, wallpaper. I know, right? You know what? I, I actually, I actually don't mind the you play stuff that much because no? you actually can get some pretty decent in-game stuff. With that. Um, yeah, but I mean, in terms of sort of middleware, um, Steam is obviously the favorite. Origin is sort of second on my list by a wide margin, and then comes like you play in games for Windows Live. So <laughs> yeah, like Mania Planet or whatever that bullshit is, and all oh, those God. things. I, I find them all a little, little intrusive. I'd rather be without them. I mean, to be honest, like I think we all love Steam because of their deals. I find as a piece of software, it's kind of janky. Um, yeah. It's, it doesn't fit in with the Windows UI. Like it, it just looks out of place. It reminds me of iTunes in that way. And that iTunes mm-hmm. just doesn't look like a Windows application, and it runs kind of shitty. I find yeah. Steam is kind of similar. Yeah, um, you ever notice that Steam is pretty laggy at times? Yeah, it does that for me every now and again. Yeah. Yeah, it's gotten better since they switched to using. Um, they they use Chromium now mm. as a or whatever WebKit as a as an HTML renderer. It seems like it's a bit quicker now. But back when it was, like, IE, it was so slow. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Spencer? What have you been uh, doing, playing stuff? Oh, I have not got up to much this week. I, I've been kind of like, uh, I was sick most of the week. So, I mean, I was at work, but I was miserable. Uh, but I've been playing still. Well, little... it's implied. It's work. <laughs> I like my job for the most part. It has its, it, it, it has moments where it's it's a bit overwhelming, but... Um, for the most part, I do like my job. And, Just yeah. in case any coworkers are listening. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't think they care. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been playing, still playing Bravely Default, still playing Sub Wars, and still really enjoying both. Um, my 3DS is getting a lot of action right now because of those two games. Oh, you're a clunker? Yeah, the little, the little beater. Um, I haven't gotten around to putting a screen protector on the XL. I got it back from warranty repair. Nice. So it's here. I just haven't. Um, yeah, I haven't bothered to put a screen protector on it yet. Probably do that this week. Um, something about, like, that's the, the, the kind of an annoying thing about those systems is they're not, like, those screens scratch if you look at them the wrong way, so you kind of have to have a screen protector. And in the case of the, the classic 3DS, like the small one, like, those screens scratch if you close the system too fast. It's just not a great design. It's weird. Yeah. I've never had that problem with any of my like my original DS, um, my 3DS, no problems. Uh, my my DS Lite. Uh, well, I put a screen protector on that when I got it, and it's just out of paranoia. I didn't want to like plastic touch screens tend to scratch up like resistive ones. Um, but yeah, I'm just paranoid. You know, put the money in and I want to keep the system pretty for a long time. Like I, I keep my shit forever, so. Like, I'll probably have this thing 20 years from now, and I'll dig it out and, you know, I'm, play. Something. Based on that, I'm surprised you don't have any plastic on your couches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't keep couches that long, though. Yeah, good point. <laughs> I got, hey, I got, look what I found in the alley, a new couch! Woo! Yeah. You know what's crazy? You remember, Nelson, remember that couch we dragged out in the alley, like, two years ago? Yep. Okay, and then it, it was gone the next day. Like, I didn't think anyone would take that piece of shit, but it was gone the next day. It's back out in the alley now. <laughs> so my old couch has, has gone through the circle of life, and it is back in the alleyway. I've actually, I've actually had that same experience. Like, we, we had a couch that we took to the, the junk day here at the, at the condo, and uh, a couple junk days back, I was walking by it, and I was like, hey, I recognize that couch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's even worse. It looks even worse than than when I left, got rid of it, because it was pretty haggard at that time. Oh, yeah. Uh, And now it's just, oh, terrible. (laughs) I didn't know that was even possible with that couch, but apparently it is. Yeah, I I, I was really shocked when it was gone. I'm like, someone really wants to sit on that. I I don't know why. (laughs) It was all sticky in the middle. Like, it had a (laughs) dead spot in the spring. So, you'd like, even if you sat on the edge, you'd slowly kind of slide towards the center. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah i will admit it was pretty comfy though yeah it wasn't too bad it, unless you had to try to sit two people on it and then you're like inadvertently touching always oh yeah <laughs> yeah i kind of remember that on gaming nights it got kind of kind of comfy you know a little yeah, awkward yeah cozy up to the person next to you <laughs> <laughs> could work to your advantage now though yeah yeah good <laughs> yeah it's all good it's fine um but yeah, that's it. Just been playing Sub Wars. And Sub Wars, man, that game is really addictive. It's, uh, I, I, I don't know. I can't put it down. It's like, I'll be like, oh, I'm done with this game, you know. And then, you know, the next day, there I am playing Sub Wars and shooting torpedoes at random mm-hmm. people on the internet. It's it's pretty fun. 
Well, when you sent me the gameplay video, like I really didn't have much of a opinion on that game. But when you showed me the gameplay, I was like, that actually looks kind of fun. I figured it would be a lot more confusing, but it's pretty simple, which simple is good. Yeah, it's really simple to learn. Um, like, there's not much to it. You, know, you have your sonar, and you have a map, and you have homing torpedoes, and you have regular torpedoes. And there's sort of a risk-reward reward with using the sonar, because the sonar reveals anyone nearby, unless they're standing completely still. But if you use it, it gives away your position to everyone else, too. Huh. And that leads to some pretty interesting gameplay where, and the fact that you can't communicate efficiently is really kind of neat too, because you can usually at the start of the map, everyone on your team will, will force code out their position. Um, and you just try to head towards your teammates. You can team up and, and work as a te- as a group, but just because you can't communicate fast, cause you have to type everything in Morse code, <laughs> <laughs> you have to be really, um, really efficient with your comms. So, yeah, it's it's a fun game, man. I highly recommend it. If you have a 3DS, just download it. It's free to try. It's free to play as long as you want. Um, and if you want to unlock more subs, you can always just pay the $10. And you don't lose. Like, if you've... As you play the free game, you'll actually earn unlocks for playing the free game. And once you pay the $10, those subs will be unlocked for you already. So you don't have to restart by paying. It's a pretty decent free-to-play model. It doesn't feel exploitive. Huh. Like, you can just play that game as much as you want, uh, hop into any multiplayer match, you can level up, you can customize your subs, add crew members, change the paint schemes. Really, the only thing that's locked out to you is some of the more advanced subs. And aside from a couple, like the level 45 subs, they're all fairly balanced. Like, I, I played a long time with the free version and it had a blast. Like, I didn't ever feel like I was at a huge disadvantage for using the free submarines. So, hmm. um, good on Nintendo for not being EA. See, as I mean, Nintendo offering up some freebies now and then, it, it's I think it's kind of the way of trying to just get more interest in the systems and make more money, which is I'm totally cool with. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm glad they're doing it. It just seems like odd that the the couple free to play things they announced on this Nintendo Direct are for the 3DS, which is already selling better than everything else on the market. It's like, guys, you need to get give me a reason to buy the Wii U. Seriously. <laughs> and, th- and that's what they're not doing up until this point. Like they showed a couple games, like they showed Bayonetta. Yeah, it looks great. No release date yet, so that is not helping. That is not making me want to run a show and buy a Wii U. Um, all this cool stuff they showed, there's no damn release dates on it for that system, and it's not helping them at all. So. Yeah, because by the time they actually have like content that'll be worthy of making you run out to buy a system all the other consoles will be like hey we've got all these games now finally yeah well i mean that's the other problem too right now the xbox one and the ps4 don't really have any games on them either so at least nothing exclusive that would make you want to go out and grab that system yeah titanfall's just, coming soon that's true yeah yeah hmm. that is coming um did you did any of you guys play the beta of that no i didn't didn't get a chance to get into it yeah, neither did I. It looks kind of cool, though. Um, yeah, it does look interesting. But, did any uh, of you guys get an email from uh, Team Hawken? Yeah, Steam key? Yeah. I got a Steam key for yeah. Hawken. So I can run around and fuck shit up in a mech. <laughs> That's one of those ones that just... It's it's going to be free to play, but right now it's early access. So you have to pay to get into it on Steam, if I remember right. Mm. Uh, it looks like You have to buy yeah. like a Founders Pack or something. Oh, yeah, you're right. You do have to buy it. Uh, Pro Starter Bundle is... Right. Uh, 30 ten bucks. bucks. Oh, 10 bucks. Right. There you go. Pro Starter Bundle. Except for us, because we got our Steam keys. Oh, good for you. We're early access, bitches. <laughs> so apparently they're shutting down their own matchmaking service, and they're switching everything over to Steamworks, by the looks of it. Huh. Yeah. Is that good or bad? Probably a good thing. I think um, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like... Steam is sort of the one thing that everyone on a PC has. We are we already all have our friends list setups, mm-hmm. our friend list set up. I, there's no real reason, or it's, it's just inconvenient to have to go into another platform and basically start over with your friends lists. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Steam does a really good job of making it easy to hop into a game with your friends. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a smart move on their part. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Why not? 
I've seen some videos on this one. I've never actually played it myself, but I have I have watched some videos on this one. It always looked kind of cool. It's got an interesting aesthetic, and uh, it's sort of small mechs, you know, like twelve foot tall mechs, not the huge stompy ones. So they're they're fairly mobile. Yep. Yeah, a little it's bit always, more yeah, like heavy one, gear. This one is than one that I've been kind of keeping up for a while. Yeah. Do you remember the uh, big push for it at PAX like two years ago? Yeah. I do. There was so much hype behind this game, and it just sort of fizzled out. Yeah, yeah I guess probably because they didn't, uh, you know, release quick enough or something. Yeah, it's funny how that happened. I wonder how free to play this thing is. Or if it's pay to win, you mean? Yeah. Well, everyone's always going to say, pay to win, pay to win. I mean, even in like, uh, what was it? Loadout. I mean, there's always people just shouting out pay to win. And it's like, what, are you kidding? Mm-hmm. You mean you mean this this jean jacket uh, helped me win against everyone else? Yeah, okay. Right. See, your, your cool factor helps must, you win. That must be it. Jean jackets are going to come back, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a thing again. What? I got a jean jacket. Yeah, I got one too. I haven't worn uh, it in a while, but. I have three. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Canadian tuxedo. Come on. That's right. yeah. <laughs> Where I was from, they yeah. called it a Lynn Valley dinner, dinner jacket. Ah, Lynn right. Valley dinner ja- nice. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, Hawken, it is an early access game. Um, mm-hmm. And there was a lot of that these days. You have, you know, Steam's got their whole green light thing. Uh, early access has become a fairly viable business model where you can sell an incomplete game that is mm-hmm. constantly updated. Uh, sometimes for a discounted price, sometimes for a much, much higher price, like in the case mm-hmm. of Planetary Annihilation. Wow, or, yeah. <laughs> so what do you guys think of that? Like, is this, is this, have you guys bought into any early access games? Have you kickstarted mm. anything? Have you greenlit anything? Well, what's the I, definition yeah. of early access? Like, yeah, that's, well, yeah, there, there needs to be kind of a, a definition, like a, a, a delineation of those things. Early access are the ones that you can buy when they're not finished, right? Okay, and Greenlight let's break are the ones down into. Let's do. Let's do early access first, and we'll cover the right. other two afterwards. Early access is basically a game that um, that you can buy that isn't finished yet. Um, that you can you can buy and play, and, and you get a license to play that one. You know, for you know when it gets finished, kind of thing. Um, okay. The Greenlight stuff is are games that are looking to get added to steam but they're not they're not actually you know they're they're looking to get a spot on steam basically and depending on the the demand for those games then you know they can be added or or, you know dropped depending on uh depending on the reaction not to be confused with pre-order games i.e assassin's creed 3 when i bought the collector's edition and couldn't play it for six months until they finally released it for pc yeah (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. yeah, there's there's a lot of options out there now when you're when you're buying a game. And uh, I personally, I, I like Greenlight. I'm not a huge fan of early access and pre-orders. I just I really don't do them anymore. No, no, me neither. Yeah, uh, I, I I find with pre-orders, I tend to lean towards games that will give me like uh, games that have been released in other territories and reviewed mm-hmm. well. Yeah, uh, Bravely Default, I pre-ordered that so I get the big collector's box with the art book and everything. Um, mm-hmm. But that's a game that came out, you know, six months prior in Japan and several months prior in Europe and had been well reviewed. And, you know, I knew what I was getting into with that. Um, you know, Shin Megami Tensei 4, I pre ordered. Same thing. I got the big collector's box. You pay a couple bucks more and you get like the art book and everything. Um, and again, that's a game that was reviewed really well. Like Famitsu gave it almost a perfect score. So, and that's a, a franchise I'm familiar with. But, yeah, I very much shy away from pre-ordering anything digital. I don't see any yeah. advantage to it. You, know, you yeah. might get a little bit of cosmetic DLC, but it, you know, wait till the reviews come in. There's been so many bad game releases in the last couple of years that, you know, games that by all means look great. Look at Aliens Colonial Marines. Those trailers Oof. are awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I was pretty itchy to uh, pre-order that, and I'm really glad I didn't because... Yeah, no kidding. It looks pretty terrible now. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the last game that I actually pre-ordered was XCOM, the reboot of XCOM. I think that was the last one that I pre-ordered. I just I haven't done it in a, in a in a year or two now. But yeah, I don't I don't really feel a need. A lot of times the the stuff that they give you as bonuses for pre-ordering, a lot of that stuff eventually just unlocks anyways. Like I go back to games that I haven't played for a while and and hey look, I got all the pre-order stuff. You know, a lot of that stuff seems to happen on Steam, so I don't yeah, really feel or, any desire to do it. 
or they release that as super cheap DLC, like they did with um, XCOM, the Elite Soldier Pack, which gave you the ability to customize yeah. the colors of your soldiers. Um, yeah. They released that for like a buck. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, that that's a case where, okay, that dollar, you know, a couple months down the road, extra is, you know, by, by paying that extra little bit for the DLC after the fact, you're... Um, you're just making sure you're not paying $60 for something that's going to be a lemon. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not just like going on the publisher's word that this is going to be great. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it gets especially like when there's a media embargo around a game prior to launch. Like that's, yeah, it's not, a, that's not something you want to buy before. No, absolutely out. not. Yeah. If they're, if they're, if they're locking it down and preventing people from talking about it before the game comes out, like before it's actually on shelves, then yeah, that's, that's, number one clue that you're not going to get a good product at that point <laughs> yeah but um but pre-orders aside what about early access have you guys bought any early access games i have uh don't starve i bought don't starve early access yeah. um my experience with that was was pretty positive i thought it was i thought it was interesting but uh, honestly my my big thing with with um early access the reason why i kind of stay away from it now is because i want to uh, you know i want to i want to get something that's a finished product like i got i kind of got tired of don't starve before a lot of real serious content updates went into it and i don't really feel any any need to to go back to it now you know you know that's that's a really good point um i i had a similar experience with prison architect where i played a lot of that game as an early access because you know, this was a case where it was a company that had a, uh, they had Sorry. a good bunch of releases, like a bunch of really solid releases under their belt. They had Darwinia, they had Defcon. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they're an interesting introversion's an interesting company that puts out good products. So mm -hmm. I felt pretty confident going into this, especially since the, the, your know, early access game had been well reviewed, and I watched gameplay videos and I saw it, and it, it looked like something I wanted to play, and I really enjoyed it. But now I feel like I've had my fill of that game, and. I don't know that I'll ever go back and play it again. And, I, and that means I might have robbed myself of playing the complete product. Because by all, by all accounts, there's been a ton of content added since I played it. But I just feel like, you know, I've, I've been there, done that. I'm, I'm ready to play something else, you know? So, hmm. yeah, that's, that's definitely a worry. But, you know, conversely, Kerbal Space Program, uh, I bought that in August of 2011. Back when it was, it wasn't even called Early Access. There was just an option to donate money to the developers <laughs> and uh and as a result of me donating um they gave me a license key to the to that game which is basically it gets still considered unfinished you know yeah. all these years later but it's gotten amazing like it's just a, such a replayable amazing game that every release they add some huge swath of content that you know adds so much to it that i keep coming back mm -hmm. uh, so technically don't uh sorry to interrupt but don't um telltale games technically also fall under the purview of of early access slash unfinished because they don't actually make the complete you know five episodes or whatever well, all at once not, they give you yeah. little bits now and then and i i, I see that as a bit, a bit different I, those are those are kind of serialized games you know that you're getting a certain amount of content and that more content will be coming mechanically those games are finished like yeah okay you know That's a good point. the 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 actual the way they play is not going to change but you're just going to be getting more content i mean those are almost like ex buying expansion packs only the thing is you you front load that you pay for the whole thing up front and then they release it sort of in a periodical form yeah almost like yeah it's kind of like a season's pass except you don't have to pay for a full game up front and then pay for the season's pass after the fact right I just wonder with those games if they like hash through the entire story all at once or if they just do like one chunk and then do the story and the coding in another script. I would imagine they have, to, they have to have the story. Yeah, I think they have the story locked down before they actually get to the point of, of you know, they they probably decide where they're going to have their breakpoints and they have, you know, in terms of plotting it, they plot rising action, falling action within each sort of section so that you have, you know, digestible chunks. And then and then sort of parcel it out that way. Uh, Just makes me wonder though if they have like the story and all that in predefined and whatnot. Um, why wouldn't they just release a complete game? Well, I, I feel like it sure. takes time to get everyone in the studio and record all the lines and you know build out the interactive portions of it. I, mm -hmm. You know, you can it's it's like you could 
with Babylon 5, like they wrote an outline for that thing before going into production, but it still took them, you know, X number of years to get all the seasons filmed and, and fleshed out, right? Right. Hmm. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It's hard to say. I mean, you'd you'd really have to you'd have to ask somebody who worked on those games to know for sure. But I have a feeling that that probably the way it works is there there's an outline, there's a sketch of of where they want the story to go before they actually divide it up like that, and then the actual nitty gritty of getting down and writing the dialogue and and doing the, the plotting and pacing and and all that kind of stuff. That that kind of stuff can probably take place in between installments. So technically, they go Breaking Bad with it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, they where probably they, where they have a general idea, but they, uh, you know, every episode, so to speak, um, they write content and deliver. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to say for sure. I, I mean, unless you actually asked somebody who worked on those games, but that would be my that would be my guess if I had to guess. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, in terms of in terms of um, early access stuff, I think it's good for. You know, we're seeing a kind of a change in the way games are being made these days. Instead of, you know, having to, to come up with a concept and, and, you know, develop IPs and stuff like that, you can you can have people sort of working on this stuff, getting people excited for it before it comes out and, and sort of contributing as the game takes shape and, and maybe feeling more like they're part of the community, like they're actually having a hand in developing it. I think that's what you're seeing with a lot of these sort of Kickstarted type stuff. Um, the things like um, what's the one Star Citizen? That's, yeah, that's 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 a big one. I yeah, mean, I mean biggest crowdsourcing video, biggest crowdsourced video game project in history. I mean it's got yeah. a budget now that rivals some AAA games. So yeah, um, and it's got it's got the talent behind it to make that work. And but I think you're seeing a, a real level of transparency with that game. Um, you know, in terms of the development process, that you, you don't really you don't really see a lot in the industry. So I think it's I think it's just really a shift in that kind of sense. Like the developers are 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 being more democratic about how they develop the games, whereas before it was always like, you know, you you can you can have a say in what you think about it after the game comes out. Now people are actually being able to influence the direction that that the development takes. Yeah, it's also you know it's it's allowing studios to or smaller teams or in the case of Star Citizen, large Star Citizen larger teams. Um, mm-hmm. Create games without interference from, you know, business school people telling them right. what focus groups think or mm-hmm. having marketing people tell them what tests best with their audiences. It's like they get to make the games they want to make and the people who want to fund those games can fund them. And I mean, I've, I'll, I'll admit I'm fairly wary of most Kickstarters, but there are yeah. definitely a few that have piqued my interest. And most of them are ones with big names behind them, like Chris Roberts, you know, mm-hmm. Star Citizen, yeah. it was an easy buy for me because Chris Roberts has just consistently put out great games and you know when i saw a chance to play a new wing commander you know, even if i only ever played the single player version of that it'll be have been worth the 40 dollars to get in on that yeah yeah for sure so i'm, I'm pretty excited um have you guys kickstarted anything at all or do you are there any kickstarters you guys are interested in right now um not right at the moment no i haven't i haven't really looked into it in a while but uh i remember seeing a few things on there that i was that i was kind of interesting nothing nothing leaps to mind right at the moment though uh for me I, I typically just don't bother kickstarting anymore i've been burned a couple times in the past on deliverables and whatnot and it yeah the whole kickstarting games just doesn't seem something i'd be willing to commit to anymore i mean if it's something really awesome and i know it's going to be great and it's put on by people that uh have made brilliant games in the past sure but yeah, like I'm with Brian on this one. Nothing comes to mind that makes me really want to pony up some dollars for something that I may never see a deliverable on. Yeah. yeah, I you know it's funny. I'm like I'm so skeptical of the whole Kickstarter thing, but there are definitely a few that I'm looking at right now that I'm super mm-hmm. interested in. Um, you know, one of the ones I kickstarted recently was DCS World War II Europe, and again, this was based on the people behind it. Um, Olak or Oleg Maddox is involved in it and he's the guy behind IL-2 which is one of the most famous flight sims in history um, it's an amazing product you know it's, it's, it's ancient by today's standards but it's still totally playable it's still got a huge community behind it and seeing that they're plugging into a really good engine like the, D- the digital combat simulator engine that A10C and Black Shark and all those pretty famous games run on um, 
that was an easy one for me because it was forty dollars for a whole bunch of planes, and the more DCS content I have, the the better. <laughs> so that, that was an easy one for me. Actually, um, there was there was one that I was looking at fairly recently. It's this one called Seven Framed. Have you ever have you guys heard of this? No. It's huh. like a first person. Um, it's like a first person thing where you're basically framed for a crime and you have to kind of escape and kind of go underground kind of thing. It's really bizarre. Where is it here? Single player game, single player campaign game. It, it basically starts off, it, everything's like kind of in a first person perspective and you're like this waiter in a hotel. You take this tray up to this guy who's like a politician in his room and when you wheel the tray and he's like lying there in the bathroom stabbed to death. And the <laughs> next thing you know, it's like people are pounding on the door trying to get in and you basically have to run out the window and, and like run for your life basically kind of thing. And everybody's hunting for you. It looks it looks pretty interesting. Where is it here? Uh, seven Frame puts you in the role of not one, but seven citizens targeted by groups that would control them, set up for crimes you did not commit. Seven Frame allows you to pr- play from not only the perspective of all the victims, but of other characters in the world. Every shift in point of view brings new insights into the agenda of the enemy and brings you steps closer to solving the mystery of why you. Why were you targeted? Huh. So it's, yeah, it's kind of like Enemy of the State, the game, or something like that. <laughs> It looks kind of interesting. Yeah, it looks like uh, they're not doing so well in the funding at this point. They're at fifty yeah, yeah. dollars of three hundred thousand with huh. twenty-one days to go. So that's the other yeah. thing is like, where do they come up with these magic numbers for how much a game is going to cost to dev and stuff like that? It's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I that, imagine that, yeah, it's going to cost ten grand to make and you're going to buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me see here. There was another one that I was looking at too, but I can't remember the name of it right now. It was this. Um, it was like a. It was like a cross between a four X and. Um, um, it was like a cross between a four X game and a science fiction role playing game, where basically, you went around like you were you were playing as the crew on this one ship, this one spaceship, and you would go around to different members of your crew and like develop them as uh, develop their skills and stuff like that, and you would actually get like role-playing type missions from them as well to like improve your ship and stuff like that i can't i'm scrolling through kickstarter right now but i can't remember for the life of me remember the name of it Hmm. that i could get into um i really you know like i i enjoy that's one of the things i enjoyed about the original mass effect was just being able to walk around in your ship and interact with your crew members it's a trivial thing but it, it, it really helped the immersion and it really helped that ship feel like you know, your home away from home in that game. It's like every time you got back to your ship, you could breathe that sigh of relief. You're like, ah, okay, we're back. We're yeah. back where we need to be. And uh, yeah, they, they did a really good job of kind of emotionally tying you to that vessel and that crew. And, you know, I could totally get behind a 4X game with a similar yeah. interaction with crew. And yeah, it looked it looked really good. There was, it, was, it had kind of a Russian theme to, or theme to it too. It was uh, like, oh man. I can't remember the name of it right now. Let me see if I can find it. I'm going to see Wait, if I can Battleship Temkin. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like that, yeah. yeah I, what, what, there's a couple I'm, I'm very much looking forward to at the moment. Um, th- I didn't kickstart them, but they're ones that, you know, they got their funding so early on that I'm just going to buy them when they come out. Um, and again, these are ones by developers who are seasoned. Uh, you know, Way Forward did the Shantae Half Genie Hero Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know... The Shantae games have all been really good, and Way Forward has just put out solid gold. Like, I can't think of a single game of theirs that I've played that I haven't enjoyed immensely. So, you know, that's one that it got funded. I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. Um, you know, there's Mighty Number no. Nine is a pretty famous one. Uh, Kenji Inafune's Mega Man follow up. Was that Mega funded? Man <laughs> Did that one actually get successfully funded, though? Yeah, yeah, it was successfully okay. funded. And the other big one that I'm super excited about and also i didn't kickstart but it did get funded is unsung story uh which is being headed by uh, yasumi matsuno who is the man behind uh ogre battle tactics ogre final fantasy tactics uh vagrant story and final fantasy 12 and it's a tactical rpg uh turn-based tactical rpg uh and it's got a they've got a, a big name board game designer behind them coming up with the mechanics behind it so it should be really interesting to see how this plays out because uh, Matsuno is one of those guys that's really obsessed with systems. <laughs> and if you play the game Crimson Shroud on the 3DS, it's kind of a short mini RPG. It's very much like the personification of a tabletop 
game in that you roll dice to attack. Like, you actually roll dice with the touch screen. Oh, nice. 3DS, and all the characters are little pewter figures. So whenever there's cutscenes, it's little pewter figures standing around each other talking. It's so weird. But he, he's taken the whole, like, tabletop RPG thing. Um, and just he, you could tell he really enjoys playing with those concepts. So, and they've got a great staff behind it. They got a, a Akihiko Yoshida as the character designer, and they've worked together as well during on Ogre Battle, Vagrant Story. He was a character designer for Bravely Default, the Final Fantasy three and four remakes, um, and Final Fantasy twelve. So you got this like, an awesome artist behind it, and uh, Hitoshi Sakamoto is doing the soundtrack, and he's the guy behind Radiant Silver Gun, Gradius five, Tactics Ogre. Um, again, I Final found Fantasy it. Tactics. <laughs> Yay! Sorry, I found it. Um, sorry, go ahead, Spencer. I'll I was going to say, but that, that, that's done. unsung story. You guys should check it out. The The Kickstarter page has a lot of information on it. It looks really cool. So, you know, that's one to look at, look for when it comes out. Okay. The game I was talking about <laughs> is called The Mandate. The Mandate. Yeah. Sounds boring. No, no. I know that the title is awful. Plus, it, you know, it, The Mandate. <laughs> 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 but uh, no, um, they've actually put out an interactive ship designer. I think that's out. They reached their crowdfunding goal. They got seven hundred grand, seven hundred grand per, pledged for against the five hundred thousand goal. And it's yeah, it looks like it's going forward. But yeah, just have a look at that. I, I'm it watching looks, the trailer right now, and it looks it looks unbelievable. Very cool. I love the uniform design already. It's got a. Mm. You're right. It's got a very kind of Cold War look to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's nice to see the captain wearing a full dress uniform. That is awesome. <laughs> you just said the captain's wearing a full dress uniform. uniform. Full dress uniform. Sure. Full <laughs> pauldrons and everything. Oh, that is that looks awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and and trust me, I, like you watch some of the videos on this thing and it looks like it's going to be, it looks like it's going to be fantastic. They have a really interesting kind of art style and kind of a world design going on with this thing. And, and just the, um, kind of the, the, uh, the, what they're going for with this when like when you, when you listen to the, the videos that the, they put out on their own channel, it, it just sounds really, really fantastic. Oh, hmm. like, All like right. storming, storming, doing board, Boarding actions with your ship and like controlling like you know doing like kind of real time strategy boarding actions on enemy ships and stuff like that, you know developing your your crew and you know having like space battles and and ship based battles and, and and all that kind of stuff. It, it just it looks really cool. Galactic exploration, you know, it it just sounds like pretty much everything I've ever wanted in a game. Pretty much. <laughs> I'm looking through it right now. I don't recognize any of the staff, but uh, mm -hmm. it seems yeah, like it's... it seems like they've all they're all seasoned veterans, um, having worked yeah. on a, a fair number of big name titles. So mm -hmm. uh, well, that's interesting. I'll, uh, I'm going to bookmark this and keep my eyes on it because it looks like yeah. uh, looks like something I definitely want to play. I really like 4X games, um, especially really crunchy ones that you can kind of jump into. But I find a lot of times, uh, in the case of like the X games. They're so, mm -hmm. um, it, it seems like it's very hard to get into at first because there's very little direction yeah. kind of pushing you. Like there's not enough narrative pushing you to do things or pushing right. you along your, your way. So if they can add that, add that narrative and add that sort of like story to structure the whole game, um, I can see right. this being amazing. Yeah. See, I, there's a line in here that I like. We wanted to make a game where you're not a solid singular object in a skybox. You are a captain in an evolving, dynamic ship that hundreds of people call home. They adapt to you and grow as you fight alongside them. And if you suffer losses, you'll feel the loss that comes with that. Yeah. So and they say that's where the drama is. That's where the story happens. And it's all and it's, and it's the interacting with the people on the deck that makes this a complete experience. So, so I'm guessing it has permadeath. I'm guessing it does, yeah. It looks yeah. that way. That, that that adds a lot, I find, to strategy games. Um, I really enjoyed um, Fire Emblem and XCOM for that. And the, yeah. the fact that you could lose staff members, and in Fire Emblem especially, like you could use, you could lose story critical staff members, or um, not staff members, uh, story critical <laughs> party members, like people mm -hmm. that would, if they were part of the game, have these huge dialogue trees, and those would just disappear in an instant <laughs> if you made one wrong move. And there was something very cool about that. Um, yeah. A sense of permanence 
in your yeah. action. So. Yeah, for sure. They had this one really cool thing where they were showing, um, like, when you're actually fighting in a space battle, it, it realistically models, like, when the interior of your ship, it realistically models that. So when you take hull damage in a sp particular section, you might have whoever's working in that section get blown out into space. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's it just kind of little things like that that kind of caught my eye about that one. So, hmm. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, how about you, Nelson? Any Kickstarter? Have you kickstarted anything or you're, any Kickstarters you're looking forward to? Not particularly. I mean, I don't know. It's not something I, I actively look at for the most part, just because, again, kick, I've had bad Kickstarter experiences before. But I have bought games that were successfully funded and released through Kickstarter, but, you know, sold on Steam. But that's that, that's kind of like where the game's origins came from was Kickstarter. But yeah, yeah. I've had, had a few of those. FTL was one of those ones. I had no interest in Kickstarting, but I, I picked up once it was available. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Kickstarter is just not really my my preferred method of trying to source games. I guess. Yeah, you're de you're definitely taking a risk. I mean, that's even more so than pre-ordering because the product may never ship, or it might ship completely different from how they said it was going to be. Like it might be a significantly stripped down product. So you never know. Yeah. It's no, like, I, sorry, I guess... this game will seemed awesome at the time, but no, we changed it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's always like again, that's one of those things where you're kind of putting the fate, your faith in the in the developers themselves, you know, rather than a studio or a large company. You're like, these are names that I recognize from games I love. Hopefully, they deliver and make another one. Yeah, <laughs> I will love. Yeah, one of the interesting things I think about Kickstarter is that you actually get people, like people who fund these things, kind of get involved in the game like i'm just looking through this this uh, mandate one and if you pledge like ten thousand dollars to this thing you you can basically design a quest that will be in the finished product nice <laughs> like they'll let you they'll let you make your own quest line basically so that'd be all right but you know 10 grand that's that's a lot of money just to be like yeah so i made that quest it's an escort quest it was really annoying <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, exactly. you, i i'm i spent 10 grand to troll you fuckers <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah. yeah. Um I know I, I it looks like I might have actually gotten burned on one of mine. I, I on Indiegogo funded uh the DCS MiG twenty one, which I was very much looking forward to. It's a pretty iconic Cold War fighter and having a full simulator of it would have been amazing. And it looks like there were some internal problems with the team in terms of who was getting paid what. Oh, crap. And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the whole DCS MiG-21 forum disappeared from the DCS World forums. What? And there was, um, I mean, it, it looks like we're going to get refunded for it, but I'm pretty disappointed that this one fell through because mm. he was putting out updates every week showing progress on this thing, and it was looking amazing and then it looks like due to some internal conflict, it's not going to get released. Yeah. And that's a damn shame. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's the double, that's like the flip side of this whole, you know, democratization of, of games development thing. Occasionally you're going to see the bad side of it when projects just, you know, don't happen. Yeah. You know, you're going to, there's going to be things that you really want to happen. You're going to get all excited about, and they're just not going to, not going to come to pass. And that's, yes. again, cool. kind of why I'm leery about funding these types of things a lot of the time, because eh, situations like that, I mean, sure, they're few and far between, but all it takes is one or two bad situations or in examples where all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I'm just going to stop funding games. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, this, this falls back to, like, I'm more apt to kickstart something by an established company. Yes. Like, um... You know, like introversion games or way forward. Or double fine. Or double fine. Yeah, it's another great example. Um, but it makes it, me think, though, like companies like that that are established, you figure they'd be able to just put out their own goddamn games using the money they made on other games? I think it comes down to creative freedom. You know, I think they don't want to have business school graduates, like people with MBAs, telling them what game to make because who the fuck cares what those people think? Um, yeah. People with MBAs are the reason that you see Activision pumping out exactly the same game every single year with a slightly different label. Um, they're the reasons 
like EA focuses so heavily on their sports franchises. Like those are the kinds of things that business school people love because they're not creative people. They're not games people. And, you know, they're, they're all about the almighty dollar. They're all about the focus groups. They're all about, you know, appealing to the lowest common denominator. And you take those people out of the picture and you can get a game like star citizen. Well, do you think it's possible that they may even use Kickstarter or any type of crowdfunding methods as a way to kind of gauge the interest in their games? That definitely could be it. I mean, if you have a project that doesn't get funded, that's a pretty good indication that maybe there are people <laughs> out there who actually want to play a game like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, th there's been a failure at some stage of it, whether it's at the concept level or, or letting people know that it's out there. Yeah. It's it's Darwinism, you know. It's it's kind of applying the model of Darwinism to gaming. You know, it's taking it out of this kind of artificial environment and letting the projects that are destined to survive survive, kind of thing. Well, and I, so. I think that's actually an interesting kind of way to sort of get a feel for if your game is going to be good and well received, or if it's just going to tank. Like, mm -hmm. huh? I never thought of it that way until like basically just now. So yeah, it's it's kind of the ultimate in in sort of capitalist democracy, right? Like vote with your dollar. If if people want what you what you're trying to produce, then they'll they'll vote with their money. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that brings us around to the last kind of thing we talked about, which was uh, green light. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and this is a little bit less of uh, putting your faith in a developer as it is voting for projects that you want to see on. Steam, um, right. which is interesting because a lot of these are available outside of Steam, and it's, mm -hmm. it's more a matter of, like, for a lot of us, Steam is a preferred method of managing our licenses, and it's saying, mm -hmm. we want this game on our platform of choice, right. and we have this democratic way of going about it. Um, do you guys think this has been a good thing for Steam, gamers, game developers? Um, I think it's had its growing pains. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of ways that that, that system could be gamed originally. And, and you know, the, you look at, there was a case with uh, a game called, I think it was Paranautical Activity, where they had to <clears throat> basically go through the, the green light process like three times, even though the game was, was available already on, on services like Dazura, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's... I think it's I think it's a good thing, and I think you know Steam has to do it just to respond to kind of in you know the the pressure of the marketplace. There there like you said, there are other places out there that you can get these kinds of games if you want them. I mean, Desura being sort of the big one. Um, but you know I, I I don't know. I look at those descriptions. I look at screenshots. I can't really say for sure, you know what whether or not you know I want to put my support behind something. And it it's it's fairly low impact, I guess, but still. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know. A lot of times I find there's not enough to go on with the green light stuff. Yeah, I, and, and I feel mm. like it's also kind of cluttering up the Steam marketplace. Mm. Um, like, I feel Steam does a fairly poor job of curating their content. And yeah. the huge glut of new re indie releases they've had since they've implemented green light seems to have made it even harder to find the content you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, well, that's it. Kind of, yeah, you're right. It does kind of fuck up the searches because when you're, say, just looking around by genre, um, and you pick a particular genre that you like, you know, the top. It's only going to give you the top hundred, even though there could be like five thousand games in that genre, and mm -hmm. it just makes it damn near impossible to find anything potentially good because you're too busy looking through a list of like cluttered up, crappy indie flash game bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a problem that Apple and Google both have in that you have this huge, huge, huge amount of content in their marketplace, and it's very difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, and I don't know that there's an easy fix for this. It seems like Greenlight is a way of at least asking people what they want to see on the market, which is more than yeah. what Apple and Google are doing. Yeah. Um, it's all about the fart apps, man. Yeah, <laughs> that was the whole joke. Yeah, I remember that. Like back in the day, it's like you couldn't get an emulator approved in the Apple Store, but it was very easy to get your fart app on there. <laughs> but I mean, I have voted for a significant amount of green green light games. The sad part is, you know, once the game actually comes to full release through Steam, at that point, it it one it takes so long and Two, sometimes the finished product is not what I was expecting when I saw like the, uh, 
you know, like the little YouTube demos of the games and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, as an know. example, I'm trying to think of which game it was. Um, oh, right. Um, Contrast. That one where it, it was conceptually, it was a, you know, pretty cool looking game, um, similar to the new Zelda 3DS game where you could kind of merge into the walls and use that as a as a method for getting through certain zones and whatnot. But the the gameplay still looks pretty solid, but the voice acting in that game just irritated me. The the girl they chose to do the um, the voice acting it just felt very forced and not very not very fluent. So that's kind of why I gave that game a bit of a pass. Mm. Which is unfortunate because it seemed like it would have been a good game, but I just couldn't get past that one little thing, gripe, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I, I I voted on a few. I think the I think the reason I ended up voting on anything was because it was required for some Steam bad. Yeah. They were yeah. like, "Oh, if you want to be in this beta, you need to do this first. Yeah, that's right. I, well, I, I understand it. It's their incentive. They're incentivizing, a, um, you know, getting people just familiar with what Greenlight is and kind of get them playing with it, so they can, if people like it or find games that they're interested in, at least you know there's awareness for it. And uh, I don't necessarily disagree with with that method of, you know, like kind of tricking you to get some stupid Achievo, um, just to make you familiar with the, how the whole green light thing works. But yeah, I like green light, but again, it's, it's just one of those things where quality of games and stuff or the, the actual release version is just not as good as what I was expecting. (laughs) <laughs> but I mean, at least at that point, the the risk versus reward. Well, I think the thing is here though is that Greenlight, uh, like what specifically is that most of these are already games that are available. So that's what differentiates yeah. it from like um, early access or Kickstarter is that these are games that exist in a finished state. Um, it's just like, what's the difference? Well, in a lot of cases, yeah, I think I think a lot or of them near are still, finished state. I think least. a lot of them are still near finished, like with with the Greenlight games. I think you need with Greenlight. There's a there's a expectation that you have to have something to present to steam in order for in order for you to get consideration for that whereas with early access a lot of those are presented with with varying degrees of, of completion and i mean i you know you i don't know it's 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 kind of a it's kind of two ways of looking at the same kind of thing but for most for the most part i think you know with the early access stuff it's main, mainly developers who have a kind of a proven track record already who put out other games um, and are just looking for some some feedback and some basically some free Q and A on whatever they're developing, right? <laughs> you can get some free beta testers in there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Or no, even better, get your beta testers to pay you for the privilege of beta testing your yeah, product. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's well, kind of Blizzard does that too. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, I think you can, the 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 effect that Minecraft had on on the gaming world cannot be overstated at this point i mean none of this shit existed before before minecraft really started doing it right before they proved that before notch proved that it was basically a viable way to make a game he involved people at every step of the development he had he let people in for you know in in the alpha and at the time when this came out that was pretty much unheard of like paying for an alpha build of a game why would you do that right so yeah i mean well you got to lock in a lower price and i mean that was yeah you know for me that was the genius part of it yeah, and you know the other thing that did, and it same thing happened with Kerbal Space Program, is these are the kinds of games where you can just because they're creative games, like you can build things and and do dumb stuff with them. Like mm-hmm. you, it gave them a ton of free viral marketing. So every time someone makes some ridiculous like you know Space Jam in Kerbal Space Program, I don't know if you guys <laughs> saw that. They made a giant yeah. hoop, basketball That's... hoop, and launched into orbit and had a <laughs> a, a gigantic like b-ball player slam a ball into it it was amazing (laughs) but you know things like that or people building you know 8-bit alus in minecraft out of their red stone and having them do basic computation well things like that create a ton of free publicity and yeah i mean those games like they don't even have a marketing budget they don't need a marketing budget because you've got people who are advocates early on who are on social media like spamming everyone with the awesome stuff they're doing in these games I mean, there's 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 things to be wary of with this as well, with like the early access and the the green light stuff. I mean, like the War Z, 
or yeah. day one Gary's incident, or you know, <laughs> there's there's a there's a litany of these of these quick cash in projects that have basically been kickstarted or greenlit or early accessed, and and the developer has basically taken the money and run. You know, you look at the glut of um, survival sandbox games that are coming out. Everybody's trying to cash in on the latest trends, and you know whether whether it ends up being a, a kind of a a healthy thing for for video games or not that still i think remains to be seen at this point yeah i, I think that's that's kind of what it comes down to is the, the verdict is still out on all of these yeah. um you know some of them more successful than others there's always it might just be one of those things where these business models are not going to go away anytime soon nope. and you're probably never going to see the terrible projects go away you're probably going to still see developers cashing in and running away with having released like a bare minimum of a product. And, you know, you're going to see the rising stars. You're going to see the Kerbal Space programs and the Minecrafts and the prison architects and the star citizens. And, yeah, and the don't starves and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So do we have anything more to say about that? I think I think we've <laughs> covered most of it. The, the dead yeah. horse has now been beaten. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm. I. I that's. That, I said what I had to say. Nice. Good. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I've got a lot of games in my library that were, were results of all these other crowdsourcing funding stuff. And it's it's not a bad thing. It'll never go away. I don't think. I just hope the. Well, it's one of those things. That you you basically just spend the money that you're comfortable spending and if you get burned you get burned if you don't and have a good experience then hell yeah <laughs> so is there any video game news this week or uh um uh, i wanted to Strider. talk about yeah Strider. oh yeah Strider. go Strider's for it out. Ik ikaruga just came out on steam what yeah um, yeah which like if you haven't had a chance to play that game it's awesome it's a top-down shmup um, it was released on GameCube, but it is impossible to find the GameCube yep. copy of that. It's worth a fortune. So mm -hmm. you can get it for 10 bucks on Steam, and it's probably a better version. So, Hey, guys, Rambo the video game also came out on Steam. So. Oh, I, I saw that. It is really, <laughs> it's, it's such an impressive throwback to the PS2 era. I mean, I don't know if that's what they're going oh for. Oh, my God. It's a rail shooter on PC for 40 oh. bucks with three hours of content. This, Three whole this, hours. Yeah, just just in case anybody out there who is actually listening to this is thinking about buying Rambo the video game, do not. Just what do you, what do, you do mean? Not. This is a loving, a loving. You know how like it's really in vogue to like make sixteen bit look pixel games. They've done uh, that except with PS2 era graphics, oh like my PS2 God. era polygon counts and textures. So. <laughs> I was I was watching Total Biscuit live stream this thing when it came out, and he was just absolutely flabbergasted. This is actually a product that came out in 2014. He couldn't couldn't rationalize that. Mm. Yeah, I've seen some videos. It is probably the least impressive looking release I've seen in a long time. Can we just go back to yeah, talking about Strider? It's real bad. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> didn't, mean to, didn't mean to hijack. No, that's fine. You're allowed to talk about shitty games. But yeah, Rambo is out. So yep. you can go pick that up for, you know, like Brian said, $40. Yeah, but don't. Don't. Yeah, just don't. don't. Just don't. But maybe pick up Strider because, I don't know, I'm probably going to buy it this week. Looks good. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty tempted on that one, actually, which kind of surprises me because I remember having really bad experiences playing Strider as a kid, but... I think in my adult life it would probably be a little easier, a little more fun. Now, which Strider did you play? Did you play the NES one or the Genesis one? Both. Okay. Yeah, because they were very different. Oh, <laughs> use all yeah. OG and legit. <laughs> yeah, the arc arcade version was beautiful. Um, yeah. Hard, but beautiful. Very, very, yeah. Yeah, I, and, I, I... Yeah, and afterwards I played the Genesis one, so... Which was a port of the arcade game, right? Yeah. Yeah, I seem to call it being very similar. So, yep. yeah, I have. I actually have the Genesis one. I should bust it out one of these days. Maybe I'll bust it out before I buy the new one. It's been a while since I played it. So, <laughs> what else yeah. in news though? Anything else actually? Uh, Humble Bundle Eleven is out. Ooh, what's in this one? 
Uh, hang on one sec. I will tell you. This is the one with uh, guacamole, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, already really totally worth it if you don't already own guacamole like me. Guacamole, oh. uh, Dust and Elysian Tale, Gianna Sisters Twisted Dreams, oh. uh, The Swapper. Oh, nice. And That actually sounds uh, like a really fucking do, good bundle. Yeah, if you do above the average, you get Antichamber and what? Monaco. Holy shit. That is, that is a solid bundle. I mean, so it's... Yep. It's four dollars and sixty cents to unlock the additional two. And Antichamber is really fun if you haven't played it. Um, yeah. The Swapper I enjoyed quite a lot, um, it, mm -hmm. especially at this price. It's a no-brainer. Um, and then wow. Guacamole yeah. alone would be worth this. So Dust that's... Dust and Elysian Tale is supposed to be fantastic as well. Yeah, I have it. I haven't played it yet. Um, I picked yeah. it up in another bundle at some point, or during a Steam sale. Who knows? God, and that comes game. that comes with soundtracks, and apparently the the Swapper soundtrack is quite good. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm kind of bummed because I own a lot of those games already, but at the same <laughs> time, eh, it's for charity. It, plus it's for charity. Away. Plus, yeah, I mean, you know, Steam code giveaways um, for maybe lucky listeners one day. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm, hmm. Plus the soundtrack. There are more games. Yeah, there are more games going to be added to that soon. Uh, I have a feeling that probably tomorrow or the day after they'll probably start announcing what else is going to be added to that bundle. So. Holy shit. But that is probably the second best humble bundle I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I own everything on this except for Gianna Sisters, which I'm not that interested in. So. Yeah, that's I'm that's that's path. pretty much. The Gianna Sisters is acknowledged to be the kind of the weak point of the bundle, but it's apparently it's still quite it's still quite good. So, hmm. but, but I do own the rest of these and a few of them I have not dug into nearly deep enough at this point. So, but I think that is a great deal. I think if you don't, if you don't have this, the Swapper or Guacamole alone or Antichamber, any one of those three games alone is worth the $5 it's going to cost okay. you for this. Yeah, um, I agree. And getting the rest of the, like, getting them all for that price is awesome. So mm -hmm. yeah, that huh. is a salt deal. Plus, it uh, goes to Child's Play, so. Oh, nice. Isn't that a Penny Arcade's charity? Yep. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's, that's their charity, so uh, it supports a good cause. Always good to help them out and think of the children. Think about the children. Think, think of the, the children. children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about, I guess. Huh. Um, in the notes, Dan had mentioned uh, 2K, or not 2K, um, what are they called? Uh, guys made, uh, you guys made Bioshock. Right. Du, 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 du. Hang on. Dan. Irrational. Ken Levine. Irrational game. They're shuttering the doors. What? Uh, yep. Yeah, so Why? Ken Levine has announced that uh, he is done with Irrational, and he is shutting the doors. He wants to make smaller games using uh, a more startup approach, like a small team. And yeah. he, yeah, he wants to make narrative, like more narrative focused games that have higher replayability. And he, the, the doors are shutting on Irrational and they're letting yeah. everyone go except for a group of 15 who he's taking with him or he's st that are staying on board and creating a new division within the company. So in other so. words, he'd cherry pick like the best people. Yep. That sounds fine. like I, it. I do yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah. It's my company. Uh, I, I do think, what I want. Yeah. I think this, this was probably, this probably came about because Ken Levine was basically after, well, basically after Bioshock Infinite, he realized that that with you know the traditional model of of how he's made games is not is not going to work for much longer, like large teams making huge, you know, huge games with big storylines and stuff like that. He wants to do something a little more stripped down, and and um, the consensus on this anyway seems to be that he wants to do something a little more stripped down and and sort of you know rock and roll kind of thing. Um, but basically, yeah, the the fact that they're shuttering the entire studio just because you know he wants to change the way he he he's going to work that that kind of sucks. It, it does. I can't help but wonder how much of this came from the parent company though, because in their earnings call they didn't mention Bioshock at all. Wow. They only like they only talked about Grand. I, I have a feeling, although the numbers aren't out there, that if Bioshock had sold as much as they'd wanted it to sell, I mean, this is a game that has a six year development cycle. Mm -hmm. Um it costs a fortune to make. Like you do not have a product in development for six years on a tight budget. It doesn't happen. 
And I have yeah. a feeling like if that game had made back the money that they spent on it, they probably would have talked about it in their investor call. Yeah, I think um, so. So there, 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 there might be some of this might have been pressure from 2K to say, hey, guess what, guys, this isn't working. Uh, I um, think, I think, I think Levine probably just he just wanted to simplify. He wanted to he wanted to strip down and, and do something a little less narrative driven. He wanted to focus more on on if you read his speech, he he basically wants to focus more on on kind of emergent stories, stories that come about as a result of gameplay rather than forcing the character or the player down a down a linear path. So and I guess he wants to make smaller games because, you know, with a team of 15, he's not going to be making a, another Bioshock Infinite. That that much is for certain. Mm. I don't know. No. Be interesting to see what he comes up with, though. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not a huge fan of Bioshock, but that game did a lot of things really well. Um, yep. Gameplay was not one of them, but, yeah. you know, they, they, they built a pretty impressive world. Yep. And a very beautiful looking world. Um, so hopefully some of the art design team stayed on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, from what I heard, though, most of those people have landed on their feet. I think Bethesda picked up a lot of the uh, a lot of the slack in terms of the the people who are out of work. So, ah, Bethesda's got the money. So, yeah. Well, it's good to hear. I mean, I no I noticed on Twitter the day this was announced, um, Capcom Vancouver was like, "Hey, we're hiring. If any of you guys want to relocate, it seemed yeah. like a lot of game." Like a lot of studios immediately reached out because you would think the people that stayed on through Infinite, um, you know, these are probably pretty solid people. Like they were, they did release a solid product with a crazy development cycle. Like it, you know, six years with a huge crunch at the end. You know, if these people weren't broken by that experience, they're going to be yeah. solid, solid. But this, players. yeah, this also kind of signals the death of uh, of the Boston game development scene, from what I've been reading too. Um, Big, huge games is gone. Harmonix is nowhere near the kind of force it used to be in the industry. And now Irrational shutting down. That's That was pretty much the... All there was the another was company in Boston recently that had a bunch of layoffs, too. Um, forget the name. Um, was that Big Huge? Yeah. Or might have been Big uh, Huge. How does he come up with these names? I don't Sorry. know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I heard so, but yeah, it will, it'll be interesting to see what comes next. Yeah, they're doing Disney yeah. Infinity now, but they're they're doing that with much smaller teams than they were doing for the the rock band stuff, apparently. So. Yeah, yes. they're also they're also working on a first person shooter that's like Are rhythm they? based. Yeah, oh, it's crazy. Like a and it has some rhythm mechanic built in, so like really? certain weapons fire on like certain parts of the beat. That just sounds horrible. <laughs> well, you got to use those rock band drums for something, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is a valid point. <laughs> I, I don't know. It could work, man. If you ever played Space Invaders Extreme, it kind of has a bit of that <laughs> rhythm game built in. And yeah. as bonkers as that game is, it absolutely works. So I'll give it a try. It's free to play. You know, I'm not going to judge it now. It seems goofy, but it might be genius. Who knows? Space might bring Invaders Extreme. Back. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah! If you haven't played that, get it. It's like <laughs> it's on the DS. It, it's it's super cheap. You can get it for seven bucks on just about any uh, online store, and totally worth the seven dollars. <laughs> I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> it's Space hmm. Invader. That is extreme. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and, it, and it's ridiculous. Like it's the most self-aware game I've ever played. It's so much fun. This game's extreme. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you guys hear? But extreme. Did you guys hear that that a, a new Super NES title was released recently? Oh, you mentioned yeah. something about that. Do yeah. tell. Nightmare Busters. The first new Super Nintendo game to be released on the market since 1997. Now, is it going to be released in cartridge form or just in yep. e shop? Yeah. Yeah. They send you a cartridge. Wow. That's Part badass. 68 bucks for US, yeah. 75 for the. Mm, yeah. Reasonable, reasonable. I mean, considering how much it costs to like print the boards and have them all mass produced mm -hmm. and packaged and formed. Yeah, and... comes with an instruction manual and a, a genuine kind of throwback Super NES box. <laughs> That's actually pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting looking game. Looks kind of like um, a little bit Contra like. You play as a little like gnome guy, and you shoot cards. And, uh, 
you're a leprechaun. It looks sorry. totally super NES. It looks like a, it looks like an absolutely super NES ass super NES game. <laughs> now this this game actually has an interesting backstory, and it's a game that was in development back in the '90s and was abandoned by its developer and was picked up by um, this group of enthusiasts, like Super Fighter Team, picked up the rights to it and mm. have completed it. Like they've, they've ironed out a bunch of the bugs and since decided to release it. Um, and this isn't, this isn't completely without precedent. There was a, there's been Sega Genesis games released in the last mm-hmm. few years. Um, right. Actually, there's, there's quite a few consoles now where you can buy games. The Dreamcast has had games released for it consistently since it died. Um, up until the, like this year, there was a couple games released. Um, TurboGrafx Super CD, there's still games being released for that. Um, Sega Genesis, like I mentioned, Pure Solar was the big one. Um, it's an RPG that was released a few years back for the Genesis. Right. And it's very cool in that it also, if you were one of the first people to buy it, they gave a CD with it. And if you had a Sega CD, it would actually access that drive for the soundtrack. Sega CD. You could have CD quality <laughs> audio on your cartridge game. Hey, I had one um, of those. <laughs> isn't there yeah. isn't there that other that other site? Um, they still release the occasional NES game. They were the ones that made the the remanufactured or kind of re-release of uh, Nintendo World Championships. I think it was. Or there was a game released. I can't remember the name of it now. But yeah, they uh, Retro USB yeah. sells dev kits for the NES. As well as like flashcards and stuff, and they they have a couple of independently developed games on there as well. Now, I think it's this is really cool to see though, um, because there's also a big Atari scene. There are Atari 2600 games being released still that you can buy on cartridge, and and this to me, as someone who's really interested in classic gaming hardware, is super exciting. And I <laughs> I would see more of this stuff. Um, well, considering it, you own pretty much every console ever made, practically. <laughs> there's a few missing from the collection, but yeah, that, that's, there's a lot. Um, and having new content for these consoles was great. And what would be super cool is if these guys were able to release Nightmare Busters on the eShop. I think that would be um, a really interesting development if that ended up happening. But uh, there's been no word on that yet. Right. Highly unlikely. <laughs> yeah, it's not a licensed Nintendo product, so... That's one thing that kind of bugs me. It's like Nintendo, come on guys, why don't you play along with some of the some of the other dudes who want to like make cool shit and just release their stuff and give them a cut. Well, they're starting to uh, they're starting to open up to indies quite a bit. Um, there's a, there's quite a few like Shovel Knight and I mean their Nintendo Direct featured a whole bunch of indie games like Retro City Rampage and Shovel Knight and there were a few others I can't remember the names of. Because they weren't that interesting looking, but <laughs> I don't know. With a title like Shovel Knight, it almost sounds like shovelware. But Shovel Knight looks good, though. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, just, I, had, I had duck- to go there. I to yeah, go there. <laughs> it, it it has sort of a Ducktales pogo stick mechanic. Um, be hmm. interested to see how that how that pans out. But I'll probably pick it up on the 3DS when it comes out, or on Steam probably. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I just kind of wish Nintendo would do a little bit more to branch out and just try and stay more relevant, I guess. <laughs> there are a lot of things I wish Nintendo would do. Um, yeah. Fix there are their a lot shit. <laughs> fix, fix their online store. Fix their account system. Let me let me have my account be on both my 3DSs so I, I don't have to like have some games on one and some on the other and never be able to transfer it to you. That's horseshit. Um <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, like that's a... one issue you're running into with the sub game already, where it's like you've got all your unlocks on one console and you own your, you know, other one, but you can't transfer that shit over. Sorry, it's yep. all locked down. Yeah, so my 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 little 3ds, my beater system, um, I, that's the one I've been playing Sub Wars on, and I've put a lot of hours into it and leveled up to like level 30, and got all these subs unlocked, and I've got all my customizations done, and I got unlocked all these crew members and paint schemes and I can only play it on this system. There is no way for me to move that save game over to my XL. And it's just really annoying. Um, there's no reason for that in this day and age. Because Nintendo is the only company that pulls this kind of shit. Yeah. Uh, like, if I could only play Steam games on the computer that I bought the games on, I wouldn't use Steam. No. That. And you don't see this crap from Microsoft or Sony or 
Apple or Google or any other major online software marketplace, Amazon, like you name it, they all are doing this properly. And Nintendo seems to be the only one locking their purchases to hardware. And it's about time they ended that. Um, because, again, we've said this before, they have the best back catalog of any company right now. You know, they have 30 years of amazing games that I would gladly pay for if I could play it across multiple systems and have those save games synchronized. But uh, they are not playing ball. So I'm more than happy to dig out my Super Nintendo and play the games on that system. (laughs) And spend the few extra bucks to actually... Pick, uh, replace the battery backup on some of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's a, that, that it, that's the thing is it's less convenient to play on the original hardware. I do love the original hardware. I've invested a lot of money in buying um, the correct RGB cable so I can hook it up to my RGB monitor. Um, you know, I've gone the distance, but it'd be so much easier just to like pay five bucks, play the game on my 3DS, and it would give me a reason to buy a Wii U. Yeah, but you know. As it stands, I've got a whole bunch of bins full of old ass consoles and a, <laughs> you know, Sony professional video monitor on my desk <laughs> to play these things on. I'm not gonna lie, I'm still pretty jealous about that monitor. <laughs> it was a good purchase. I should post some pictures of that on the site one of these days. Can we do that? Boy. I'm sure we can. So, we'll have to talk to Dan. Dan Dan's the guy that runs the site. <laughs> I mean, I, I can always just throw in links to stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks. You know, we we should actually, um, yeah, something we could start doing, linking back to things to talk about. Probably have to chop this part out because we don't necessarily want our internal discussions out in the wild. Or maybe we do. I don't know. <laughs> Guys, what should we do? Keep what it loosey goosey. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it easy, y'all. Um, okay, so we're we gonna. Sorry, go ahead, Spencer. I know. I was gonna ask. Are we gonna? Is uh, uh, that sounds like we've pretty much wrapped it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should wrap it up here. We're at what, but an hour and a half our, now? Yeah, to our audience, though, feel free to email any questions, uh, concerns. If you have any suggestions, I already said suggestions. If you have anything you'd like us to talk about, feel free to email it to us. Uh, if you have a funny story or recollection about games you've played or technology that is you know, relevant to your life, you know, feel free to email that. Maybe we'll read it on the show and comment. So, listeners, get involved and tell your friends about it. Tell your friends about our podcast. If you like it, tell people about it so we can keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> For free. <laughs> <laughs> we are enthusiasts. That's all we are. <laughs> yeah. We're not like talk. Niche games. Yeah. All right. All right. I guess that's as good a place as any to say goodnight. Cool. That's a wrap. This has been the Backspace. Have a good night.